When you go around and you think of air pollution today, you can end up thinking of cities like Beijing. You can spend a week there and never really see the sun. You can kind of see that before and after a rain, a lot of that rain has knocked out a lot of the chemicals that are in the atmosphere. And it's these chemicals that have adverse health effects. So you can see that in Western Europe, going back in time to London in 1952, they had this great smog. It was difficult to see, but thousands of people died. And that led to a lot of legislation to try to deal with this problem. We had the same problems in North America. And so then you got to look at what is air pollution? It's not only chemicals in the atmosphere, but there are chemicals that have bad health effects. And since we're breathing it in all the time, it's really going to affect our lungs, it can affect our heart, and it can lead to increased cancer risks. So where are these chemicals coming from? Well, a lot of these chemicals can be produced naturally. So you can have forest fires, you can have volcanoes, they can all produce these types of hazardous air pollutants. But you, all can, you can also have stationary sources. You can think of these sources as being industrial, like factories. Then you can have mobile sources like your own car. Uh, you can have a bus on the road. So if these sources are negatively impacting us with their air pollution, we call these things pollutants. And in a lot of your environmental science classes, you could simply memorize the different types that are out there, the different types of pollutants. Uh, you'd start with volt organic compounds. We call these VOCs. So these types of pollutants are like formaldehyde, um, stuff that's in gasoline that you put in your car. Anything that's really organic and be diffused into the environment. It's based on carbon links and carbon molecules. Then you have carbon monoxide. This is just an odorless gas. You have nitrogen oxide or NOx and you have sulfur dioxide that's produced through the combustion of coal. Uh, you also have particulate matter. This is basically like dirt. This is suspended solids that are in the atmosphere. And finally, you have chemicals like lead. These are all primary pollutants that float around in the air. That means these pollutants are produced by the source themselves. But you can combine this with other chemicals in the atmosphere that produce secondary pollutants. So, for example, nitrogen oxide produces nitric acid, and sulfur dioxide produces sulfuric acid. And then, these two in the atmosphere combined can produce acid rain, or more generally, acid deposition. This has huge impacts on life. We had huge problems with acid deposition several years ago. And one of the pollutants that you're probably most familiar with is going to be ozone, and that's produced through the sun. And you also need nitrogen dioxide to produce ozone. And if you go out and you combine a lot of these together, then all these pollutants can make up smog. That's probably the most famous type of air pollution that you at home are familiar with. And it gets exacerbated by things like temperature inversions. So how do you control air pollution? Well, you can regulate it one way. The Clean Air Act in the United States was able to reduce pollutants and save a lot of lives. And so technology is able to scrub out some of these pollutants out of the air. You can take it out of the source uh, before it gets released into the atmosphere. Where is this air pollution coming from? You know, like what are these sources? Well, the sources of this air pollution can be stationary, like, uh, like some of the factories behind me. They could also be mobile, like all the cars that are stuck in traffic down here. Or they can be natural, like a giant forest fire that can increase the amount of air pollution. But regardless, how does this pollution affect us? Well, it's going to go through your cardiovascular system. And this is just like smoking. You can think of it in that way. It's going to lead to things like lung disease, heart, heart disease, and increased risks of certain types of cancer. So where are you going to see these health effects the most? It's really going to happen wherever you have industrialization. So it's going to be clearly in places like China, but it's also going to happen in Eastern Europe and in New York City. We have a huge amount of industrialization and we don't have a lot of regulation on it. So you can go through those primary pollutants again. You know, remember, we have volt organic compounds or VOCs. An example is going to be gasoline that's evaporating into the environment as you tank up your car. Now, formaldehyde, if you go to a pine tree, those are volt organic compounds or VOCs that are coming off and that can lead to things like smog. You have carbon monoxide, which gets produced naturally through photochemical sources, but it can also be produced through combustion. Now, all of these different sources produce carbon monoxide. You can also have nitrogen oxide, or NOx, and that's going to be nitric oxide and then nitrogen dioxide. It's this 
brown gas that contributes to this color that you see in smog. You've probably smelled that if you've ever been around like a coal power plant. And you can kind of see here that in the United States, it's going to be restricted mostly to the East Coast um, because we're going to have more industrialization, more coal power plants here. And then if you look at dirt or particulate matter in the air, these are going to be really tiny and small solids. So you can kind of think of sand as an example of a particulate, but sand is too big to float around in the air. It's not small enough. Um, your hair is also very small, but it's smaller than your hair. It's going to be the order of maybe 50 to 70 microns in size. Your hair is thick compared to particulate matter. So we're talking about things that are smaller than a human hair. Smaller sediments that as you breathe in, the hairs in your nose and your respiratory tract can't trap it. The particulate matter is going to go into your lungs and just like smoking, it's going to get stuck there. And this can lead to other types of diseases. We also have chemicals like lead. We used to add lead to our gasoline and there are really huge neurological impacts of lead. It impacts how you think or how your brain develops. Now again, these primary pollutants can produce secondary pollutants. And so the nitrogen and the sulfur can lead to nitric acid, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And these can all come together and lead to acid rain. This acid rain can dissolve statues, but more importantly, it changes the pH and the whole food web is impacted. This can impact living systems. Then you have ozone. Ozone, talked about this a few minutes ago, it can be good. If you look up in the atmosphere, into the stratosphere, way up there, the ozone that gets produced naturally is actually up here blocking harmful ultraviolet rays. But if you move down closer to the Earth, it can produce tropospheric ozone. And this is really bad ozone. It's one of the large things that contributes to smog. Uh, this is photochemical smog. And so this photochemical smog, um, there's a lot of it in Mexico City. And you can almost draw a line and say that, you know, you can see in the sky where the smog is and you can look above it, it's clear, below it, there'll be a different color. This will be split whenever there's a temperature inversion. And when the heat inverts in the air, it can block the pollution down by the ground. So in that environment, the sun is heating the earth. And you're going to have air near the earth that is warmer. And if you look at the temperature gradient in a lot of cities, it's going to go from warm at low altitudes to coal and then even colder air as you move up. That gradient is really important because it's going to move a lot of the pollutants up and then away from the city or wherever they get produced. But sometimes, due to weird air currents or wind, if you look at the geography of the city, you can get what is called an inversion. And that's where the temperature flip-flops. What you have is a layer of cooler air near the earth and warmer air above it. That's inverted. And so as you move up, it gets warmer. And then it gets cooler after that higher up. So what you're doing with a temperature inversion is trapping all the air pollutants near the surface of the earth. They can't really escape, they can't move up, and they can't get away. And then you're going to have chemical reactions near the surface due to that inversion. And photochemical smog gets caused by these things. Nitrogen oxide, volt organic compounds, and the sun. If you look at that chemically, you can have nitrogen dioxide. And if you have sunlight, what's happening is you can break away a free oxygen atom. Now, that free oxygen atom can then go out and combine with atmospheric oxygen, and it can start to produce ozone. Now, what's smog? Well, it's essentially these nitrogen dioxide compounds and then ozone. But what's going to happen naturally is that these are going to kind of spontaneously move back and forth. They're going to move back to nitrogen dioxide and regular tropospheric oxygen. And so again, to make smog, you have to have not only nitrogen oxide and the sun, but you have to have these volt organic compounds out there in the atmosphere. Now, how does that work? Well, first you have to break that nitrogen dioxide molecule apart. So you're producing nitric oxide. And then when you combine these volt organic compounds together in the atmosphere, now what happens? Well, you produce this ozone, but it's not really spontaneously going to go back again. Now, how do you form smog? Well, to get smog, you have to have these volt organic compounds, and you have this nitrogen dioxide, and then you need sunlight. And so in areas like Los Angeles, where all of these things kind of come together due to a lot of auto exhaust, you have a huge amount of smog. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to go out and to try to prevent smog from forming. 
you can stop the amount of nitrogen dioxide going out to the atmosphere, you can prevent the amount of ultra-organic compounds in the atmosphere. Um, but how do you eliminate air pollution? Well, you kind of have to do stuff like that through legislation. So in America here, at the, at the EPA, we have restriction on the different amounts of pollutants. And so the Clean Air Act is probably the most famous one. That came out in about 1970. And what they did was they put strict standard on these pollutants over. And when you go to industry, you're limited on how many different types of these pollutants and how much of these pollutants you can put into the atmosphere. Now, how do you go and how do you do that? Well, technologically, you can use something called a catalytic converter on cars. This is essentially going to grab onto that nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide that gets produced in combustion. You can then use mechanical filters or different types of electrostatic filters. Um, these produce a gradient and it's going to grab onto some of these pollutants, usually things like particulate matter. And you can scrub the air. You can also use wet scrubbers as well to kind of wash the air as it goes through. So as the air goes in, the polluted air will go into the scrubber. You can have a mist eliminator and you're going to have water here and that water is going to grab onto a lot of those chemicals. Then they're going to move down into some packing material. The water is going to hit that and the clean air is going to kind of come out of the other side and you can collect the water and that has all of your air pollutants in it. So think about this for a little bit. Um, I'll try to fill you in on some other facts soon.